Chapter 5. We anchored at Dominico, a very fair island, and inhabited by many savage Indians. They are continually in wars and will eat their enemies when they kill them, or any stranger if they take them. Master George Percy, Observations. Every sound wakes me. I crane my neck. Is this the night someone will murder Captain Smith? But each time it is only one of the men groaning in his sleep or the retching of one of the poor souls who has not yet gotten over the seasickness. And so Captain Smith is still alive. We anchor at one of the Canary Islands, Grand Canaria. I steal a glance to go on deck and have my first sight of land in many weeks. Huge gray mountains, steep and rocky, rise up into the clouds. A few of the sailors go ashore in the longboats to fill our barrels with fresh water, and then we are on our way, riding the trade winds west toward the West Indies in the Caribbean. Captain Smith is still in chains, chains though they have freed his wrists and only his ankles remain shackled. When I bring him his morning wash water, he is writing. I glance at the page, then quickly look away. I don't want to be caught being nosy. He washes his face, takes off his shirt, and washes under his arms. I hand him a cloth to dry with. When he is dressed again, he looks at me hard. Reverend Hunt says you can read, he says. It is a cross between a question and a statement. I nod my answer. He tells me your mother taught you, but your mother was a commoner, a peasant, correct? Yes, sir. Can you tell me how it is that she learned to read, he asks. She was taught by a friend, sir. It was a son of our gentleman landlord. I don't tell him that he also gave her the silver locket when she turned 13, or how when their friendship was discovered, he was sent away to France. I see, he says, and goes back to his writing. I wonder how Captain Smith can be so peaceful while he is locked up like this. Since the moment he nearly punched Master Wingfield, the moment when he reigned in his anger, Captain Smith has been calm. That first day, he had me bring him his paper, quilt, and ink. When Julius Caesar was in prison, he wrote, he said, so I shall do the same. He has been writing ever since the story of our journey, and he writes and remains calm. The whisperings have changed. Now they say that Master Wingfield has some of the other gentlemen, and some of the other gentlemen made up those charges. They say those gentlemen hate Captain Smith because he is a commoner who has no special respect for nobles. They say you can't hang a man just because he doesn't respect you. It's a strange way. Even though he is still a prisoner, Captain Smith seems to be winning the battle. James and Richard come down the ladder, talking the whole way. Richard is carrying the oatmeal pot for our mess, and James has a slop bucket he has just emptied. Captain Smith does not need me anymore, so I hurry toward the steaming pot of oatmeal. I have to eat fast to get enough. We servants are always served last when the food is running out, and Master Wingfield's servants, Henry and Abram, are big, greedy men who empty our mess pot in two gulps if we boys don't get a head start. I grab my spoon and dig in. Yes, that's what he said Richard is saying. They don't wear any clothes at all. They just paint themselves different colors instead. The sailor said he heard it from a French sailor who had already been to the New World. What else? James asks. That the women make cuts and burns on their faces and bodies to make pictures on them. Then they put colored dyes in the cuts and burns. They think it'll make them look beautiful. <coughs> I snicker and nearly spit out my oatmeal. Richard gives me an annoyed glance. He said that the men have long hair a yard long on one side of their head, and their hair is shaved close to the other, he says. And they decorate their hair. One of their favorite decorations is they cut off the hand of one of their enemies and dry it in the sun, and then tie the dried hand into their hair. Henry and Abram join us. Henry is broad and fleshy and always enjoys an opportunity to smack one of us boys. Abram has cut hair the color of carrots and one eye that wanders everywhere except where he is looking. When they sit down to eat, Richard 
James and Richard are silent for a while as they shovel oatmeal into their mouths. There's a plate with five chunks of moldy cheese on it. I go to grab the largest chunk, but Henry slaps my hand and takes away and takes it for himself. I want to slap him back, but he is three times my size and could easily throw me against the wall with one swipe of his arm. I grab a smaller piece of cheese and stuff it into my mouth, green mold and all. They also said there will be Carib Indians on the island in the West Indies, Richard continues. They said the Caribs chop people up for their cook pots and eat them. Now James looks pale and terrified. <laughs> Henry starts, don't worry, lad. They don't want you. You're too skinny and snotty for their taste. He slaps James on the back hard enough to hurt. Then he and Jane Abram go off to their card game with the other common men. What else did you hear? I mock James in a sing-songy voice. I can't believe he is so gullible that the sailors are able to fool him like this. It's true. You know, Richard glares at me. I heard the sailors talking. I heard it all with my own ears. James nods. His eyes wide and scared. You are Dunces, both of you believing that rot, I say. Don't you think the sailors knew you were listening? Don't you think they're up there right now laughing their heads off about that stupid boy who was eavesdropping and believed all their lies? Richard and James exchange a look. You think they were lying, Samuel? James asks me, hopefully. I think you're an idiot, I say. Those sailors are playing games with you. They're almost as bored up there as we are down here. I look at Richard. Do you really think a woman would make cuts and burns in her face to look beautiful? Richard frowns and shakes his head. Then stop talking about it, I say. Moments later, we hear the call. Land ho! Richard grabs the empty oatmeal pot, but they yank it out of his head. Hey, that's my job, he shouts. I brought it down. It's my job now, I say. I run up I run to the ladder with the pot. No way am I going to let this chance slip by. Up on deck, I squint in the dazzling sun. The sails billow bright white against the blue sky. The breeze is warm. I go into the railing and search the horizon. There it is, a green bump in the distance, in the midst of the jewel blue sea, the first of the Caribbean islands. I give the pot to the cook and linger, breathing in the sweet air, marveling at the brightness of it all. Richard comes up on deck, and James too, and several of the gentlemen, until the first mate calls a halt. He drives us all back down below, threatening to beat us boys with an oar if we don't hurry. The tween deck is a buzz, with gentlemen and commoners both, wondering what this land sighting means. Will we finally be allowed off the stinking ship? We, they better at least get fresh water. What we have left smells like a sick dog. I want fresh meat. I will demand that I be let off to hunt. When the shouting begins up on deck, we all fall silent. God save us, they're coming. Look at them, they're monsters. Captain Newport, permission to man the gun, sir. James and Richard both look at me as if I have the answers. I decide I'd rather be beaten with an oar than sit in the dark tween deck, waiting to be devoured by sea monsters. I scramble up the ladder to the deck. We are in shallow waters now, and the sea is translucent blue. Moving swiftly across the crystal water are several canoes. In the canoes are the very creatures conjured up by Richard's stories. They are naked, their skin painted red. The women's faces and arms are tattooed with patterns. The men's hair is long with beads and bones. Human bones? Hanging decoration? They are coming quickly toward our ship. <gasps> I catch my breath. I expect to hear the scrape of the canoes being loaded. But instead, I hear Captain Newport's voice. We are not Spanish barbarians. We will not slaughter these people unless they attack first. Get Smith now. Two sailors swing down into the tween deck, and there is the clanking of chains as they unlock Captain Smith's irons. Captain Smith emerges from the tween deck. He stands on the deck watching the approaching canoes. His back is straight, his chest puffed out. He does not look afraid. 
only determined. A tall man stands up in one of the canoes. He is naked. Except for a ring of bones around his neck, he raises his hand. Captain Smith does the same. Captain Smith begins speaking strange words and using hand motions to communicate. I easily understand the hand motions. We come in peace, hand over his heart. We desire trade. He dangles several strings of sparkling beads. We need food. He rubs his stomach. The man in the canoe stoops and picks up something that looks like a very large pine cone with spiky green shoots coming out of one end. He pretends to take a bite out of it. I breathe a sigh in relief. He has understood. All afternoon, the natives come back and forth to our ships in their canoes, bringing sweet-smelling fruits and other food from their islands, which sits green and lush nearby. The large pine cone with spiky leaves turns out to be called a pineapple, and it tastes like fruit for a king. The cook names other things they bring. Mangoes, papayas, plantains, potatoes, tobacco, and in return we give them knives and hatchets, beads and copper, and they are happy. I have seen that Captain Smith's ankles are raw from rubbing the irons. That evening I asked the cook for some tallow and I bring it to him. Are you a free man, sir? I ask. I seem it to be for now, he says. He grimaces as he rubs in the tallow. The sores on his ankles are cracked and oozing. Quietly asks, How did you know the language of those natives? He smiles. Every man speaks the language of gre greeting, of trade, of hunger. I spoke with my hands. I nod. But the words, he shakes his head and whispers, those are Algonquian words, a language spoken in Virginia by the natives there. Ronoki settlers brought back wordless, and I have studied them. Let Newport and the others think they need me as a translator in these islands. It's too hot for those chains. I have one more question, but I'm not sure if I want to know the answer. I take a deep breath and blurt it out. Do Carib Indians chop people up for their cook pots and eat them? He rubs his ankle for a moment and looks at me. Only if they catch them, he says.